Hello, I'm Simon Owens, and you're listening to The Business of Content, a podcast about how publishers create, distribute, and monetize their digital content. In today's episode, we're discussing a hobby website about barbecue that grew into a media company with millions of dollars in revenue. Because I write and podcast so much about the business of media, I regularly get emails from founders of niche media companies who want to tell me about their successful ventures. A few months ago, I received an email from a guy who identified himself only as Meathead, and after reading only a few paragraphs, I knew I wanted to have him on as a guest for my podcast. Meathead, who's been writing about food on the internet since the days of dial-up AOL, started the website AmazingRibs.com almost as a lark. Flash forward 15 years, and it's the preeminent authority on all things barbecue. It generates a healthy mix of revenue from advertising, affiliate sales, books, and paid subscriptions, and it grew its business without help from any venture backing. I recently interviewed Meathead about writing for AOL when it was the biggest game in town, running the third most popular wine magazine, and stumbling into a website venture that made him one of the most famous people within the barbecue scene. Before we jump into the interview, I want to talk about my email newsletter. If you're not subscribed, then you're missing out on some of the most in-depth analysis on the media industry that you'll find anywhere. This week, for instance, I wrote a 1,500-word analysis of the news network patch and whether it's actually producing quality local journalism. If you're not subscribed, then you should pause this episode right now and go to simonowens.substack.com to sign up. But don't just take my word for it. Here's Tim Anderson, who works in telecom marketing, explaining who he thinks is the ideal subscriber to my newsletter. I'd say maybe it's twofold. Um, Maybe it's people that are in-house that are looking to figure out how to tie revenue to media, or it's somebody that's similar to you that um, as we watch your progression and your success that has an idea that understands um, what their story is um, maybe has an audience that is looking to get more from them um, and then ultimately to understand how to um, turn that into a full-time job again if you want to subscribe go to simonowens.substack.com that's simonowens.substack.com okay now on to my interview with meathead Hey, Meathead. Thanks for joining us. Oh, my pleasure. I've been listening to your podcast. They're good. <laughs> Thanks. So I think we should start by addressing the elephant in the room. I'm, I'm guessing you weren't born with the name Meathead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to have to give away my age now. Uh, uh, when I was in college, the Archie Bunker show was uh, all the rage. And uh, Dad and I always didn't uh, see eye to eye on politics. And I jokingly called him Archie. He was not a bigot like Archie. And he called me Meathead. And uh, years later, when I first started uh, online and I needed an avatar, Meathead seemed the natural. So I am Meathead. And look at, you know, it's 2020 now. If you don't have a brand, you don't exist. And uh, it has worked very well for me. When I call and leave a message with a secretary, a receptionist, they remember Meathead. Yeah. So it's like a Beyonce or a Madonna or an Eminem. It's a, it's a stage name, basically, right? Yeah. I just like Beyonce. I only have a little more <laughs> hair than they do. So you wrote me an email a few weeks ago to tell me about a website that you run. And, and I knew almost immediately that I wanted to have you on this podcast. Uh, but before we talk about that website, what were you doing prior to launching it? Like, I know you have a, you had a background in journalism. Yeah, University of Florida journalism graduate, master's in art from the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, uh, wrote a column about wine and travel for the Chicago Tribune and later for the Washington Post. Uh, published a magazine about wine and travel. Uh, so I, you know, used my uh, background skills as writing and photography and uh, uh, started doing web development. Uh, had a neighbor challenge me to a uh, rib cook-off and, uh, in 2005, and I went out to the internet to see if I could do some research and find some useful information on how to beat his butt, and uh, <laughs> there was nothing out there. So I launched a website uh, called AmazingRibs.com. And, uh, so, so before we get into that, though, so you, uh, you, you were a wine columnist uh, for the Chicago Tribune and the Washington Post. So that kind of like kind of got you introduced into the food adjacent 
journalism scene, right? Like uh, in terms of like what that community really wants, what kind of content performs well. I, I'm guessing those are insights that probably later helped you once you launched a food based website. Yeah, and in fact, and I forget the exact year. I think it was around 1990. I bumped into this guy, Steve Case, uh, and uh, he was launching this thing called AOL. Uh, at the time, uh, Prodigy was the number one internet service and CompuServe. And uh, I was a Mac guy, and I was kind of fond of uh, icons and double clicking, and that's what AOL did. And uh, I hooked up with him, and I took over his food and drink section uh, soon after launch of AOL. And uh, uh, of course, the rest is history. Uh, it blossomed and uh, it turned into a profit center for me and my business. And, uh, uh, you know, I, t I like to tell people uh, once upon a time, AOL was Facebook. You know, I mean, they ruled the world. So you were also writing content for AOL, like their their kind of login vertical, like not not for their Internet website, but like this is back when you had to you're signing on to the Internet meant signing on to AOL. Yeah, you've got mail. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. And it was just in some kind of portal. Like I remember there was like a menu where you could like look at different topics. And I'm guessing one was like food and drink and it was like somewhere in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I ran what was called the Food and Drink Network. And uh, they had uh, a number of essentially freelancers, content suppliers. It was behind a wall. They had their own um, language before uh, HTML. Uh, this was uh, pretty much before anybody typed three W's in a row. And uh, it was uh, it was a cool place. Uh, we had a lot of people come in there, hang out with us. Uh, we brought Julia Child online for her first uh, uh, live chat. A lot of traffic, and uh, we were making about ten grand a month from it. Wow! And and so you were you had a sense that like people were actually looking at this content. Oh yeah, I mean you know in those days AOL paid content providers based on the amount of time people spent in your content. So we were highly motivated to create uh, sticky content. And you were probably the only game in town because there wasn't really a World Wide Web, at least not in the way that we think of it now in terms of basically limitless content. So there was only a limited number of content pieces people could look at other than if they weren't in chat rooms when they were on AOL. Yeah, well, at that time, uh, it was AOL, CompuServe, and Prodigy. They were all three uh, walled gardens with their own uh, interface, their own uh, language, programming language. And uh, uh, they were Duke and AOL eventually uh, dominated. The other two eventually disappeared. Uh, and then uh, WWW came along and, uh, you know, AOL was slow to move to the web. And uh, I think the rest is history. And did you go to Washington Post and Chicago Tribune after that, or was that before? Um, some of it was concurrent. Um, I was doing uh, all three at one time or another. And you said you learned web development, so you learned a completely different skill. Like, why did you decide to do that? Well, um, to post content on AOL, we had to learn their proprietary language. It wasn't terribly hard, but it was uh, proprietary language. And fairly early on, I sensed that the World Wide Web was going to be something important. And in those days, HTML was pretty easy. I used uh, uh, Claris's uh, WYSIWYG software, but I, you know, learning to code HTML was pretty easy in those days. You didn't have uh, JavaScript and PHP and Ruby on Rails and all the bells and whistles that we have now. There was no CSS or any of that stuff. And did you use these skills outside of publishing your own content? Like did other people hire you to create stuff or was it just for... You know, that's funny you ask. Actually, at one point, um, I, my magazine, I launched a magazine about wine and uh, uh, we were the number three book in the field. And when you're number one and number two, you can usually attract advertising. Number three we had a rough time selling ads. Uh, in fact, actually, we started out without advertising as sort of a glossy newsletter. Uh, but uh, when we got into the game, we just could not attract ads. So I sold the magazine to the number two book and uh, decided, you know, now that I had this skill set, I would try to 
repackage myself as a web developer. And I was uh, building websites for small businesses, dog breeders and photographers. And uh, that was kind of fun. Uh, but uh, I built this barbecue site as sort of a, a showcase for my skills. And in those days, there was nothing really in the world about barbecue and Google fell in love with it and the rest uh, it took off. Uh, we started drawing traffic and within five years I was making a living off of it. So you you try to you try to have a, a barbecue contest with the neighbor. You go to try to research it, can't really find anything. So that spurs you to basically launch a website where you're writing what like how to advice articles. Yeah, we started with just ribs, uh, and uh, uh, now today we cover all sorts of outdoor cooking from uh, uh, ribs through steak to burgers, to gas grills, charcoal grills, pellet grills. Uh, we're working on tandoori cooking now. All signs. I mean, we've really branched out. Uh, by far the largest and most popular barbecue and grilling website in the world. And because there wasn't a lot of, this was 2005, the blogosphere was there, but it was, uh, it was kind of fractured and, uh, you know, some niches were more covered than others because there wasn't like a rib dedicated website you said that like like google really just kind of flocked to you guys because it was looking it was hungry for providing good content to people who were searching for tips on how to create ribs is that is that where you saw kind of like that initial audience come from well yeah uh, but i must correct you there was no such thing as a blogosphere there was the word didn't exist in 2005 i believe when i was at aol we started the first blog didn't call it as such, um, a really great restaurant, uh, the Herb Farm up in the Seattle area um, was contributing content to our AOL uh, site and uh, they had a fire, they burned down. And I went to uh, the guy who owned the place and I said, would you mind keeping a diary of your efforts to get back up and running? And so we did and uh, essentially, you know, a blog uh, was then, and I think still is, best defined as a chronological content site. Um, so he, I think, was the first to do a blog within the confines of AOL back in the late 90s. Uh, but in 2005, when I launched AmazingRibs.com, uh, it was just building websites. Uh, there was no WordPress or blogging tool per se. Not that I'm aware of. I, th I think your timing's off. WordPress was definitely well established by then. Blogspot was had been created several years before that. It, uh, you might not have been following blogs at that time, but there was definitely. I I was I had a blog back then. I had a WordPress really? site. Yeah, so there was definitely I, blogs, but it, I but I but to your but to your point, there there was no there was nothing that was really putting out good content. Uh, about ribs, so you guys were able to dominate. What What did you notice? Like, was it like almost immediate that like it, like the traffic started coming immediately? Where, how quickly did you see yourself kind of growing, uh, growing an audience? Um, you know, I wasn't paying attention to Google Analytics or anything. I was paying attention to the bank balance, and uh, we had essentially just two revenue streams: advertising and uh, uh, affiliate revenue. Uh -huh. And uh, money started coming in. And so I realized fairly quickly that we had a small business here. And uh, I started putting more and more time in it very quickly, branched beyond ribs. And uh, it took off. How quickly after the 2005 did you start seeing advertising revenue coming in? Oh, gosh. I mean, we, we, we started, we put ads on there pretty soon after we launched. I don't recall. But it, it took five years before I looked at it and said, you know, at this rate of growth, this is what I'm going to do for a living. And I, I cut loose all my web customers and I, I was doing some freelance writing and freelance photography and I cut them all loose around 2010 and dove headfirst into uh, the barbecue and grilling website. And where, where were you sourcing the ads from? Like, how were you getting advertising for the site? Gosh, um, I don't remember the details, but I presume it was a network 
Um, I, that's what we use primarily now. We don't sell ads directly. Uh, we use strictly networks. You know, I'm an old school journalism major. <laughs> advertising and journalism, advertising and editorial are separate. I just tried to stay away from it, keep my hands clean of it, did not try to sell advertising directly, still don't try to sell advertising directly. I use a third party for it. And, uh, 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 you know, it, 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 it gives us the ability. We do a lot of product reviews, ratings. We've got a huge section of grills and smokers, and uh, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't pay attention to who advertises. So at some point, an advertising network approached you said, hey, we're going to what you do, just plug in this HTML, we'll take care of the ads, we'll give you a cut of whatever we sell. And then you kind of just took the check every month and didn't worry too much about uh, about what was going on the advertising side. Yeah, pretty it's much. Honest. I think that's the way it happened. I don't remember the details. And so you also said you said that you made money through affiliate advertising. How are, were you doing that pretty early? And what were you, were you mainly using like what Amazon? Because uh, that was probably the biggest game in town yeah. in terms of like linking to products and stuff like that. Yeah, I mean that's absolutely correct. Uh, I, I did. It didn't take me long to stumble into Amazon's affiliate program, and uh, I I knew immediately that uh, uh, backyard barbecue people were looking for product information. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the demographics are like 80% male. Uh, they're mostly in the, uh, 30 and up age group. In fact, mostly in the 40 and up age group. Um, uh, so we, you know, started testing and reviewing and rating grills and smokers and thermometers and spatulas and tongs. And we would link to Amazon. And we were always upfront about it. We we're always saying, um, you know, if you buy, we get a finder's fee. Um, and uh, people often said that they would bookmark our link, and we still have it on the site now, bookmark our link uh, and buy using our link to Amazon as a form of support for us. And were you, was that like a huge part of your revenue? Like, what, did you start really noticing that that was? Uh you know, picked, taking up a bigger and bigger part of the pie? In the early days, it was about 50-50, but eventually um, affiliate revenue surpassed advertising. Now they're back to around 50-50. But uh -huh. as we will discuss, by far our largest revenue stream is our memberships. And so you you start to, five years in, you, you realize you can quit all your other work and work on this. But how did you start hiring and staffing the, the site? Um. I was reviewing the grills and smokers myself, and I was also doing recipes and content. And I realized I was working, I'm still working seven days a week. I mean, anybody who starts a business is you, you're, you're, you're in for seven days a week. If you're thinking about quitting your job out there, people, um, because you're going to get rid of your awful boss, I got news for you. You're a worse boss than the one you got now. And he, you will <laughs> you will push yourself harder and meaner. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been working seven day weeks for 30 years now. Uh, it, 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 it's it's a, it's a tough road to hoe. But uh, uh, I just uh, decided I couldn't continue to do it all. And I bumped into this young man. Max Good is his name. And uh, Max was trying to get a little barbecue sauce business going. And that's a really hard business to get into because you're competing against all the barbecue restaurants that have their own branded sauce. Um, and uh, we began a conversation and I asked him, uh, I hired him. I said, why don't you become a grill and smoker tester? He's still with me. Um, he's full time. He's got a great job description. Um, I always get letters after conversations like this from people applying for his job, but his full-time job is testing grills and smokers. Is that cool or what? <laughs> and and what is that's awesome? And what does that look like? Like are they send are grill companies sending him yep. free grills to look at? Like what's that? Yeah, how does I mean, that work? he he is renowned as the world's leading expert on grills and smokers. Nobody has touched, cooked on. Um, tested grills and smokers more than he. Um, uh, he uh, 
uh, everybody uh, sends him grill. I mean, you, you got to reach out to him first. You can't just ship him a grill. We have a, a whole testing procedure regimen and policy, which we communicate to them. This is our policy. We call it the way we see it. If you don't like our review, I'm sorry, you can't call back the grill and edit our content. Um, And uh, we make a habit of giving away the grills and smokers when we're done with them. We never sell them. Um, Every fire department in spitting distance has a grill or a smoker from us. Um, And uh, he always is, is his deck is in danger of collapsing. He's got more steel on his deck. So have I. I mean, they send me some too. Uh, I mean that. And you have other subject matter experts too, right? On this, on working for you. Yeah, uh, we've got a part-time guy who's a retired uh, electrical engineer. Used to be the head electrical engineer for Exxon Mobil, and um, he tests thermometers. Um, in this day and age. If you don't use a thermometer when you cook, indoors or out, you don't know how to cook. Um, Cooking is all about temperature control, both the control of the cooking device and the food. A steak is at its most tender when it's medium rare, and medium rare is 130 to 135 degrees Fahrenheit. It is at its most juicy in that range also, and you cannot tell when it's perfectly medium rare, by poking it with your finger. Um, You cannot tell by cutting into it and looking at the color. The only guaranteed way to know for sure when it's exactly the right um, tenderness and juiciness is with a digital thermometer, and you can get one that gives you a precision reading in about two seconds. And there's hundreds of them on the market, and he tests them. We've got specialized bench test equipment that tests how accurate they are and how rapid they are. And we have a database of about 150 or 200 digital thermometers that he has hands-on tested. Uh, There's nothing like it in the world. And uh, if you want to be a great cook, you need to get a good thermometer. And all of them are linked to an affiliate site, whether it's Amazon or the manufacturer. Well, not all of them. Some of them don't have an affiliate relationship and we still rank link to them. And uh, do you do modus do rely on like a network of like freelancers and contractors or do you have full time staff? We've got about a dozen people who work for us, um, either half time or substantially full time. They're all freelancers. I'm the only one on payroll. Um, They are all independent. They all work from home. Most of them have a little side gig, uh, um, uh, but uh, uh, two two or three of them are pretty much devoted to us. So walk us through a typical week uh, for Amazing Ribs, like in terms of what content you're producing within that week. God, there's no such thing as a typical (laughs) week. (laughs) Um, I unfortunately spend about a third of my time answering emails, directing uh, work towards people on the team, um, testing uh, uh, upgrades to the website, uh, uh, working with the webmaster, working with my editor, working with my PR and writer, uh, writers, uh, uh, social media. I do almost all the social media. Meathead has become a, um, a brand. Uh, Meathead is somebody that if you're into barbecue and grilling, and a lot of people know us outside of the culinary, uh, the barbecue and grilling world, I'm reasonably well known in the culinary world, um, uh, people want to reach out and touch me. And they're delighted when they get a response from the man himself on Facebook or Twitter. So I do a lot of that stuff. Um, we have a team meeting every Thursday. At two o'clock, uh, all of us get together and on the phone. Um, our our lead, we use Drupal as our uh, uh, CMS, um, and uh, our our Drupal guy is in New Zealand. Uh, we are my editors in in in, in Pennsylvania, uh, so we're scattered to the four winds, and we get together. Once a week on Thursday, and uh, we go around the table, and everybody tells us what they've been working on, and uh, then we have a brainstorming session. And then Friday, I follow up the team meetings with one-on-one meetings, so that after I've heard what everybody's up to, um, I'll they call in at a specified time on Friday, 
and we just follow up and have any one-on-one -on -one conversations that need to be had that perhaps are confidential or private uh, personnel related or whatever, and uh, or that just need a deeper dive and we don't need to take up everybody's time with it. And uh, then we create um, a lot of recipes, um, a lot of product reviews. Right now, we're talking about how do we how do we help um, people who are stuck at home uh, cooking. Um, we're thinking about things like uh, doing a barbecue and grilling 101 uh, training session seminar. Uh, so that people who are not going out to restaurants and they love their barbecue ribs or pulled pork, uh, how to do it yourself. Uh, we're trying to figure out uh, how to help these folks uh, survive this uh, weirdness that's going on around us. So it sounds like you have two main kinds of content. There's the product reviews and then there's the kind of cooking advice, either through recipes or telling them how to do a very specific type of technique or something. Is there another category I'm not mentioning? Yeah, we're actually divided into three. We have recipes uh -huh. and we have a technique section. And the whole technique uh -huh. section is um, a lot of science. Um, you know, this is 2020. People are not content to know, just do it this way. They want to know, why do I do it this way? So there's a lot of information about how salt alters meat. Um, what happens at low temperatures? What happens at high temperatures? What is in smoke? Um, what is the difference between charcoal briquettes and lump charcoal? Um, and uh, how to set up your grill in a two-zone system. How to make your regular old Weber kettle into a smoker. Um, so there's a lot of technique. Then there's a lot of recipes. Then there's a lot of product reviews. And then there's the fourth segment, which is our Pitmaster Club, which is our membership segment. And we put a lot of energy and effort into that. And uh, we're going to get to talking about that in depth in a second. But like you mentioned, in terms of interacting with your audience, you're spending a lot of time answering emails, interacting on Twitter, Facebook. Uh, do you, is that scaled at all? Like, do you have reader forums? Is there active like community? Like, in what ways do you allow your audience to interact both with you and with each other? Um, well, we have a, a Facebook page, and uh, we post every day around three o'clock. We post a cooking tip, whether it's a recipe or a technique or a product review, and then often more than once a day with other products or news or information. Um, and I engage in their responses. Um, uh, there's, uh, always, uh, uh, a question or two, uh, and then there's always a sharpshooter who wants to argue with me. Um, and then there's, uh, uh, always a lot of people by now, so many people who have cooked our recipes, uh, chiming in saying, oh man, this is the best recipe. You got to try it. So there's a lot of back and forth, both on Twitter and Facebook. Um, we post a link that we use Hootsuite for, um, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. I don't do much on LinkedIn. I, you know, just there's every day. I, <laughs> I don't think, yeah, I don't, I don't blame you. I don't think LinkedIn is your, your core demographic. Well, not only that, but there, you know, there's just every day there's a new social media platform. I just can't keep up with it. It's just eating me alive. Um, I just turned 70. I want to t start taking one day a week off. So <laughs> I'm, I, you know, <laughs> Um, and, and we have a comment section on every page of our website. And there's over 3,000 free pages on our website. And people post comments and questions. And uh, I try to engage there. We have um, three. I bet you it's high quality discussion on those articles because like people are probably subject matter experts. And because you don't write about politics or anything, there's not, there's probably fewer trolls and stuff like that. So I'm guessing there's some, some good like tips and advice that people can find inside the comment section themselves. Great guess. We don't have trolls. I think we average um, five people a year that we have to delete their posts. Um, uh, <laughs> it's usually, it's the funniest damn things. We have a humor post. Um, you know, I'm in the Chicago area and we take hot dogs seriously here. And it is a rule that you don't put ketchup on hot dogs. And I have a whole article about no ketchup on hot dogs. And I back it up with quotes from Dirty Harry and, uh, all, all over the place. And people get agitated. I mean, they just get 
PO'd about how dare you tell me I can't put ketchup <laughs> on hot dog. It's just hysterical. Um, uh, but no, uh, we don't have too many trolls at all, um, either there or in our pitmaster club. And uh, and yes, there is some really intelligent feedback. There are some really good cooks out there, and uh, we've we've got a good following. And how did the distribution change over the last 10 years? Like you said, it was almost 100% from Google early on. How much is coming from social media? How much is coming just directly to the website itself? Like what's your, are, are most of your readers like drive-by readers who are landing on a single page and then leaving? Or how, how do you, how does your, your audience interact with your pages now differently than they did when you first started? Um, about 60 to 70% uh, come through uh, organic uh, uh, Google or other search engines, as you know, Google is the primary one. Um, and uh, uh, about 30% are repeat return visitors, people who bookmarked us. Um, and then uh, there is just a, a smaller number of people who stumble into us, who perhaps um, I do a Facebook Live once a month. Maybe they stumble into that and they go to the site. We're, we're constantly, well, I mean, I'm hoping that some people listening to this conversation will stumble in. Uh, you know, we try to reach out to the world as much as we can. That's a big topic right now because when you depend on Google for a living, when Google sneezes, you catch cold. And this has happened to us. We used to, in 2017, we averaged averaged 3 million page views a month and Google changed its algorithms and beginning in December 2018 we lost 30 percent of our traffic um, and I mean that's a big hit now we're still at 2 million pages a month which is pretty darn good for a culinary website I think it ranks us in the top 50 of all food websites but that's a big hit and of course Traffic means less advertising, less affiliate revenue, fewer members, and fewer sales of my book. And those are our four revenue streams. And uh, so traffic has a direct link to the bank account. And when Google uh, changes its algorithm and uh, you lose 30% of your traffic, it hurts. I had to lay some people off. Um, I had to cut some salaries. Did you get a sense of why? Did you get Did you get a sense of why your content was downgraded within Google's algorithm? Well, we have uh, we have a number of excuses. <laughs> <laughs> um, we think Google has gotten better at what they're doing. Uh, for example, in the frozen north, in the middle of the winter, if people are looking for a barbecue recipe there's a good chance that they're not looking for something to cook outdoors. They're looking for um, uh, something they can do in their crock pot or their oven. Now, the purists among us will say, well, that's not barbecue. Um, but to the public, that's barbecue. And so Google has figured out by watching what they click on that in February, they're not looking for us. They're looking for um, uh, a website with a crock pot recipe. Um, so that was part of it. Um, we also are, we've got com competition for a change. Uh, we had the field pretty much to ourselves, but now there's a whole bunch of daddy bloggers out there. Uh, most of them aren't terribly good. A lot of them are just stealing from us. Um, I even find our photographs on their website often. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of that traffic siphons off, uh, to them, uh, a number of reasons. Uh, so uh, you know we're we're just is high, is high, is high quality pho photography like a big component of your success? I don't know how I I have no way to measure that, but I think when one like are you investing in photography? Like is that like do you in terms of like do, does your your reviewers do they do you give them access to like really nice cameras? Like what's the, what are you devoting resource wise to photography? Well, as it so happens, I actually did my master's in photography, so I'm a decent photographer. And in fact, I had a conference call this morning with a man in Pennsylvania who is a master of a particular style of photography called light painting, which is a technique that I am using on my next book. And I'm taking seminars from him to upgrade my light painting skills. So yeah, photography is important. And I take pride in my photography. 
Clint, who does a lot of the recipe writing, is a good photographer, and I've helped to coach him up. And yes, I have purchased equipment for him. Um, and Max, the uh, the equipment guy, uh, I've purchased equipment for him, and he's doing videos as he unboxes these grills and smokers. So yeah, visual is important, absolutely. How did the advertising ecosystem change for you? Like, I know that you're kind of arm's length from it, but I would imagine that, you know, back in 2000, the <sighs> mid 2000s, that it was mainly direct sales where now we're living in a more kind of programmatic ecosystem. Uh, has that hel- is that true or has that helped or hurt your site in terms of revenue? I, I know that you and your listeners are not going to believe me when I tell you I really don't know. I honest to God, don't pay much attention to it. I hired a young woman who was a rep for a network. Um, she's freelancing. She had a baby. She's stuck at home. Um, and she really knows um, uh, double click, I think, is the tool she's using. And, uh, and I just turned it over to her. And she's working with three or four different networks. And she's maximizing the price she can get. Uh, it's all CPM stuff. It's not, no, 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 no CPC. And um, she sends me a monthly report, and I barely read it. I just look at the amount of money <laughs> that goes into the bank. I mean, first of all, first of all, what we know is is that the law of supply and demand applies to advertising. That uh, there is more real estate now for people to adver- advertise on, and so if our CPM prices are too high, they'll go to the daddy bloggers. Um, they'll go elsewhere. So. I leave it to her to deal with it, and it's just fine with me. I, I haven't got the patience, the expertise, the knowledge um, to deal with it, and it has fallen to our number three revenue stream. It's still important. I still want that money, but you know, it's also a pain in the butt because we some. I look at it. I, I look at our site um, uh, sometimes, and some of this advertising is just garbage it just defaces our you know and particularly the belly fat stuff and the political stuff you know and uh uh the 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 mortgage come ons it's just you know i mean we are enjoying some high quality advertising from some quality advertisers but uh some of it just uh, you know i'd like to get rid of all advertising if i could but i can't because one of the benefits to membership is we block all ads from members. If you're going to pay us 24 bucks a year to be a member of our website, well, thank you very much. We will block ads for you. So um, if I stop with the ads, then I lose a sales tool. Do you have a partnerships person who's working on the e-commerce side to, you know, if you're to set up affiliate links or is it just 100% just grabbing affiliate links if they already exist? No. Like from Amazon or whatever. No, we've tried working with a couple of freelancers. Uh, it didn't really work. Uh, Amazon, it's just really hard to get a human being on the other end of the line. Um, they did pay attention to us. We have had contact with us because we we did at one time do um, well over a million dollars a year. I think it was $2 million in their revenue, not ours. Um, but we were getting 8%, 8.5%. Um, so we were selling one heck of a lot of content. So they, they, they paid attention to us. But they've been cutting back on how much they pay. And um, uh, a lot of um, people, a lot of sellers have moved off Amazon. Um, some who are important to us have moved off Amazon. And uh, they have their own affiliate programs now. Uh, so... Uh, so, you, so it's just grabbing a link from them. The reason I ask is like New York Times, for instance, has Wirecutter, their product mm-hmm, review, mm-hmm. and they have a they have a team that's like developing direct relationships with uh, you know product companies and retailers and getting specialized e personalized e commerce links that they can plug in. But it sounds like you're just kind yes. of grabbing whatever is available, not mm-hmm. really like trying to that you don't have the resources to dive deep into, you know, getting personalized, creating deals, yeah. direct deals with like a cooker or a griller, griller or whatever to get a special cut of whatever you make selling from them. Just too small. But when, that said, when somebody comes to us and says, um, uh, we have a, an affiliate program 
um, will you link to us? Uh, our answer is, well, we need to test the product first. And if we like it, sure. And uh, then we come to them and say, uh, what's your rate? There, I guess there are two factors, what the rate is and the duration of the cookie. And uh, we try to negotiate the best deal, uh, but we don't fight them too hard. Uh, uh, you know, we, we believe strongly that um, membership is our future. Um, you know, at, yeah. So how did you, how did you end up launching that? The, the membership? Well, let, let's, when did you end up? I want to talk about that cause that's really important, but let me just finish one for uh -huh. further thought on this sure. affiliate business. You know, Amazon is a really fickle partner. Um, back, uh, I don't know, eight, 10 years ago, uh, when Amazon was fighting the States over sales tax, they came to Illinois. I'm based in Chicago. And they said to Illinois, if you start trying to charge sales tax, we will cut off all your affiliates. Now, that was me. Now, I, I don't know who buys from Amazon. I don't see that data from Amazon. But they went about and they cut off the income stream of a bunch of people. So we promptly incorporated in the state of Florida. And I had an address that I could use down there. And in Florida, they didn't try to tax Amazon, so we kept our ta Amazon affiliation. But what that told me was that at any time now, Amazon is either going to drop their affiliate fees or they may just kill affiliate revenues altogether. And that may be in our future. So you can't depend on advertising for our livelihood anymore, and you can't depend on affiliate revenue for a livelihood anymore. That leaves the sales of my book, which is... 200,000 copies, it's nice. We've gotten a bunch of uh, royalties off of that, but that's not a livelihood. That leaves only one way to go. And that's the subject that brought me to talking to you. And that's where you want to go next is our membership program. And so when did you launch that? Well, uh, back in 2005. No, 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 no. That's when we launched the website. Sorry, <laughs> two, 2014. 2014. Uh -huh. um, uh, we looked around and we started thinking, you know, we... We have this extremely engaged audience, and um, they really are interested. Why don't we try to create community? And what we did, and this is what makes us different even to this day. I mean, in 2014, this was pretty cutting edge, bleeding edge stuff. But what we did was we created a forum, a message board type environment that is the core of our Pitmaster Club. And it is a community. Um, and it, the rest of the website, all the reviews, the articles, the science, the recipes, 3,000 pages is all free. But the paywall is for the community. The paywall is for the interaction. The paywall is for the brotherhood, um, the uh, connectivity, the relationship. Now, we have since larded on a number of other cool benefits for members. But at the core of our membership program is the forum, the community. And if anybody wants to see how this works, they can just come to our site and there's a 30-day free trial. You can take the 30-day free trial. But it is so cool. We have uh, just under 16,000 paid members at $23.95 a year. So do the math, 16,000 times $23.95. Um, and we enjoy, sit down and hold your breath. 83% renewal. 83% renewal rate, that's better than the American Medical Association. Um, I mean, that's just incredible. Um, people absolutely love us. Now, part of that is due to the fact that it's auto-renew. We don't send them a letter and saying, please renew. It's just an automatic renewal. Um, but uh, it, it's just a cool place. People are in there and they know each other by name and how's your kids and is your dog feeling better? And uh, uh, hey, I'm thinking about buying a big green egg. Is it any good? What do you guys think about it? Uh, I had a problem with my brisket the other day. Let me tell you what I did. You got any ideas as to what went wrong? It's just a webmaster's dream. It is the way the internet has to go for the future.
And so it's a it's like a message board, so that mm-hmm. anybody can start a new thread mm-hmm. and and basically discuss any topic they want. They don't need to use your website to prompt them into a certain subject. We've or tried like to that. organize it because that's one of the reasons we hear from people when they do leave us is that it's hard to find things, um, uh, navigate. They're not used to navigating a message board. They're used to navigating. I mean, the, the a website like our free portion is a broadcast medium. It's us putting information out there and broadcasting it. They can comment on it and we'll answer questions, but it's really one-way communication. This is two-way communication and they're not used to this. They don't know how to navigate. They don't know how to find things. It's not hard. And most of them, you know, 83% renewal, most of them figure it out. But some people are befuddled by it and confused. And right now, actually, what I'm working on now is a a video, a welcome wagon video. Welcome to the Pitmaster Club. Here's how it works. Over here, you click this and you get that. And over here, trying to help orient people so that they can find their way around. But yeah, I mean, if you want to comment on your brisket, you go to recipes and you go under beef and you go under brisket. That's the best place. And are these hobbyists and professionals? These aren't your casual dad who just needs to find a recipe. Like these are people who are looking to perfect their, uh, perfect their skill and, uh, and basically talk to other hobbyists. Um, they're a mixed bag. There are very few professionals. Um, we've done a reader survey and I think it's under 10% that are in the business. Um, uh, and I, and when I say that, I'm talking about restaurateurs, caterers and competition cooks, which are, uh, there's a whole subgenre of people who compete. Um, but, uh, most of them are weekend warriors, backyard cooks, but it's become an avocation for them, like bicycle ri- racing or, um, uh, uh, gun collecting or stamp collecting or coin collecting or uh, uh, whatever. I mean, every, you know, there's a bazillion uh, hobbies and avocations uh, that, that people uh, uh, occupy their time and their interests with. And these are folks uh, who just absolutely love cooking and love cooking on the grill and uh, getting outdoors and you know, a big part of it is the adulation that they get. Um, Mom, can dad cook tonight? Oh, honey, those ribs were so good. Why don't you? No, I'm not going to go there. Uh, <laughs> oh, oh, we get we get letters from people. You know, I mean, I got laid last night because of your recipe. Honest to God, we get this. Um, a a, a yeah. rabbi in New York, a, a rabbi who's been sent to Ohio telling me that my pastrami recipe is a dead ringer for Katz's Delicatessen in New York. Uh, you know, I mean, just the love letters we get. You know, if I can if I can wax philosophic and if I go on too long, just cut this out. But I was a really good student in high school and college, and I thought when I got out, I was going to change the world. I was going to be somebody important and somebody special. And like so many people, when I got out, I realized I wasn't that special and it was a hard slog and I had to work my butt off to make a living and not many people worshiped me. And, uh, uh, you know, I was just an average Joe. And uh, when I started this website as a hobby uh, to show off my web skills and it grew into an industry, a little business for me, what happened is, is that dream finally has come true. It is so gratifying every day, every single day to get email, to get comments in the recipes or in the Pitmaster Club saying how we have changed their lives, how we have made their lives better, how we have improved uh, the uh, esteem in which their family and friends hold them. It is so gratifying. It's just absolutely the coolest thing ever. And uh, that's awesome. And and how do you communicate that value proposition of the membership to people who are landing on the free version of your site? Like where are you see, what did you see, what kind of messaging did you see converted the best in terms of t- converting free readers into paying Man, subscribers? Man, you're going to, you're going to, you're just going to slap your forehead until it turns <laughs> black and blue. I don't know. Um, <laughs> we have 
only just <laughs> in the past three or four months learned how to code links so that we can see which links are most effective. I forget even the tool that Google has. Uh, uh, my webmaster, I finally, you know, beat him up until he got control of this. But now we, we are just now learning which of our sales pitches are working and which ones are not. But we have, uh, you know, we our funnel is step one, drive traffic to the website. Once they're there, we try to get their attention with the idea that if they're enjoying this, they can get more. How do they get more? They need to click a link and it takes them to a page that tells them all the benefits. And it's a crappy sales tool. I'm working now to make a better version of it. But it's just, it's one big long page that lists benefit after benefit after benefit. And it's just a long snooze. There are great benefits, but it's just it, not a very effective selling tool. Uh, we, we So the, every, every single article they're on, they're seeing some kind of language, some kind of pop-up or call to action that like converts that's, that if they click on it, it sends them to this landing page that explains all the value they're going to get from the yeah, membership. Yeah, not every. Well, you know, I mean, the world is, 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 is split in half now. You've got desktop and mobile on debt. We... The, this is the old-fashioned journalist in me. We do not have inline ads except on mobile. I just absolutely refuse to stick an ad in the middle of an article. Um, so we wrap the um, content with advertising at top, above, below, left, and right, but we don't put ads in the content. Um, I've got all kinds of people screaming at me to get over it, um, and we might, but... Uh, we do occasionally slip in um, an inline that says uh, "Try our Pitmaster Club," uh, uh, but um, no, it, 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 we we put it in our newsletter. We promote it on social media. We try to promote it on the uh, on the website, but in in mobile and mobile is like sixty sixty five percent now. You know, it's always uh, a balancing act between paid advertising and house advertising. Uh, so one big thing that uh, you see a lot within the, the the barbecue world is like there's lots of live events. There's like lots of competitions. Do you participate in that? Do you run events? Do you participate in events? Do you sponsor events? Like, do you? Uh, what's your level of involvement in that? Um, I used to judge competitions. Uh, I got tired of it. It was boring, um, and it was just a lot of time travel, and I just find my sp more efficient to spend my time at my desk. Um, my right-hand man, um, Clint Cantwell, uh, still judges and occasionally competes, and he hangs out in those worlds. We're in touch with the Kansas City Barbecue Society, which is the leading um, competition sanctioning body. Uh, we collaborate with them. We uh, promote with them. We advertise with them. Um, it is a subculture that uh, probably um, has, um, we, we guesstimate, um, about 300 barbecue competition teams that compete regularly and another 500 or so that compete two or three times a year, plus uh, maybe 10,000 or so who judge. Their membership is around 18,000. They're the only society in the world bigger than ours, but I fear that they're going to take it hard with this coronavirus thing because I don't think people are going to want to sit in a judge's tent tasting food cooked for them by 24 different barbecue teams, none of whom have had professional safety uh, and food safety uh, training. So I've got a really scared feeling for the Kansas City Barbecue Society and these other competition organizations. However, all of that said, we this year announced that we are going to sponsor the first ever event for backyard barbecue people a conference in memphis in uh august uh and you know we're all holding our breath whether we're going to have to cancel or not uh, but we are running a uh a, a three-day event in um in memphis at the peabody hotel the uh you know with uh uh with a, you know people can see a demonstration of how to cook a whole hog and then we're going to have uh, seminars on uh 
cooking and pork. Uh, Memphis is known for its pork, so we're going to be pork centric. Exhibits from uh, manufacturers, and then we board the buses and go out and taste barbecue at the best barbecue joints in Memphis. And this has never been done before. Um, so we've got uh, 300 people signed up at 700 bucks a head, plus hotel, plus airfare. So everybody is spending in the neighborhood of 1800 bucks just to be there. So it's a pretty, pretty sizable commitment. Uh, uh, we're thrilled that it's going to come off, uh, but uh, we don't know what the um, coronavirus is going to do to us. So thus far, if I'm hearing you correctly, you have it hasn't. Our live events haven't been like a major part of your business model. No, um, not at all. Uh, and uh, if we get to do this event, um, it will be marginally profitable. Um, I've tried to keep the keep the margin tight because I wanted everybody there to be happy. And for year uh, for our, our our subsequent events. Um, uh, I, I would hope that we can make some more money at it. And are you guys doing much with video? It seems like the, especially like the advice section, like the technique section, there would be at least some opportunity there in terms of oh, showing people what they can be doing. We need to do be, be, be doing more video. Um, part of the problem is, is I'm a quality freak and you know what it costs to do quality video. I mean, I, I just, I, I won't stand for handheld wobbly iPhone videos, um, uh, take one and that's it. The, the video quality has to be uh, well scripted, well written, well shot, good quality audio and well edited. And that's expensive. Um, everybody out there who's doing it knows that and everybody out there is doing it better than we are. We've done some of it, um, but uh, we haven't done it as well as we'd like to. And in fact, uh, and I'll let the cat out of the bag, we have not talked a lot about this until now. Um, we are looking at a Pitmaster Club Prime. And uh, we're thinking this will be in the $94 a year range. And it will be video centric. Um, that, that extra difference between $24 and $94 will underwrite the cost of doing broadcast quality video. And we want to line up some of the top pit masters in the world and uh, do great video and um, turn Pitmaster Club Prime into barbecue TV. And uh, I, I was on your website, you know, prior to this interview. It looks like the design's a little bit uh, outdated. Like uh, I, I felt like I was take, traveling back to like 2006, 2007. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> what's, what's the thinking there? Like, uh, do you, are you guys ready for a facelift? Well, we're actually um, in the move in the process of moving to uh, WordPress. We're in Drupal now. Um, we made the move to Drupal a few years ago before we felt WordPress could do enterprise quality. Um, but uh, we're, we're, we, we, we've got the site pretty much built in WordPress and we're working our way through the data transfer. Probably won't make the final move until the fall. We don't want to mess with anything during high season for us, which is summer. But um, uh, it will give us the opportunity to refresh the look a little. But, you know, I got to tell you something. Um, years ago, before I got deep in a barbecue, I published a magazine about wine. And uh, it was free of advertising. It was on glossy stock. It was typeset. It was beautifully photographed, beautifully designed, color throughout. Great content, the best content in the field. And we got our butt kicked by Robert Parker, who was making great content also, but it was printed on buff tan stock, IBM Selectric. Um, and the difference is, is it looked like it was private insider whispering in your ear. And the lesson I learned from that is sometimes you can look too slick. Sometimes you can look too polished. Sometimes you can look too professional. I don't mind looking a little bit dated. Um, and the part of the issue is, is we use a three column layout and it really works for us. Um, I just absolutely hate the fact that so many people are viewing our site on mobile. Uh, I mean, on mobile, the site looks fine because it's the same as every other mobile site. It's one column. 
But on desktop, we use a three column layout and it really works for us. And I have not figured out how to do it otherwise until I start allowing advertising in the content. So yeah, I think the new design, the new WordPress layout is got a much better navigation system and masthead that looks a little more modern. But no, we're not going to probably make a massive redesign. And you mentioned that you had a book. Was that something you guys self-published or was that through a major publisher? Uh, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt published it. It came out in 2016. It was one of the, uh, it was the number two cookbook on Amazon for about six months. Um, it was uh, the only one that outsold us was Chrissy Teigen's cookbook. Um, mine has me on the cover. I'm kind of a chubby gray bearded guy. Chrissy was on her cover. <laughs> uh, un, uh, unbuttoned down to her navel. Um, there was just no way I could compete with that. Um, <laughs> I, I did po I did Photoshop Arnold Schwarzenegger onto the cover of my book and send it to the publisher and said, we need to reshoot the cover, uh, but they didn't buy it. Uh, um, it, 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 it's, it sold almost 200,000 copies, which is very good for a cookbook of any sort, particularly a barbecue, a, a, a niche cookbook. Um, it was really well received. It's um, there. The content is so different from any other barbecue book that's out there on the market that um, the people who bought it. I, if you go to Amazon, it's it's got a solid five star rating. I mean, you the only people who give it less uh, complain that a lot of the content can be found similar on the website, and that's their complaint that it's not unique just to the book because I wrote great content for the website and some of it I adapted for the book. But other than that, and, it's just solid. And it sounds like though, that you don't want to make this as like a continuing, like some, some of these media companies, like they're just constantly put, putting out new books and stuff. And that's like a part of their revenue strategy. That sounds like you don't want to go that route. Well, actually that's an interesting thought. I'm working on a sequel. The last book was science oriented. The new book I'm working on is art oriented. And I'm, I want to, I want to challenge my readers to uh, become more creative, to do things different than just hamburgers, hot dogs, steaks, ribs, chicken, and to experiment with new ingredients, to use Asian flavors and Spanish flavors and hybridize. And so, uh, uh, I, I'm really amping up my photography skills for this book. Um, and it'll probably be the last major book that I do. Um, and it brings together full circle my training in art uh, with my uh, training as a, uh, a cook. But um, we have started to experiment with um, smaller books called that we, we've created a little um, imprimatur called Deep Dive Books. And uh, we did our first one on what we call sous vide Q. Sous vide is a very interesting cooking technique that involves um, uh, very precision temperature control. And when you combine it with barbecue, we have created the name sous vide Q and you get a really great product out of it. And so we did a Kindle book, strictly ebook, um, uh, and we just published it about, uh, six, seven weeks ago and it's three ninety nine on Kindle and it's a really good book and we're going to do more. We're going to do some, uh, focused strictly on steaks or, um, burgers or whatever. And so we're going to start doing these, um, uh, three ninety nine deep dive books uh, that are eBooks and see how that works. See if that turns into a revenue stream. Uh, so my last question, what is the exit strategy here? Cause, uh, you mentioned you're 70, you probably won't want to do this forever. What's the, I mean, is this, uh, are you want to sell to the New York times to, or what, what do you want to do? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I did a magazine years ago and I didn't name it after myself. I, I did. I mean, I'm, uh, my brand meathead is tied up intimately in amazingribs.com, but it's amazingribs.com, not Meathead's website. Um, I, I learned long ago in business that if you name it after yourself, you just have no exit strategy. So yeah, it's for sale right now. I mean, I haven't, I don't have a broker or anything like that, but if uh, somebody were to come along and say, uh, you know, this is a profitable website, 
and that reaches a great niche. And if we could bring in uh, some of our designers and uh, some of our tech people, uh, and, and, and if Meathead will stay with the company, uh, this would be really cool. And I have no desire to leave. I don't, uh, I, I, you know, you, you're going to find me with my head on my keyboard. Uh, I, that's my exit strategy. I'll, I want to sell the company and, uh, I would love to do it. Um, but, uh, I want to, I want to get the right partner. I, I want a partner who will grow this business uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I mean, I look around at what happened to Huff Post. Um, I just, you know, shudder to think about something like that happening to it. Well, uh, hopefully an enterprising media entrepreneur who's listening right now to this podcast will, uh, reach out to you. Oh boy. Would that be great? <laughs> I'll cut you in on the deal. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm going to hold you to that. Um, so, okay. Those are all the questions I had for you. Uh, where can people find more of your work online? Well, amazingribs.com is where we live and hang out and I'm there. I'm easy to reach. Uh, they can find me at uh, facebook.com slash amazing ribs. Uh, I'm at meathead on Twitter. Um, we have presence on other social media, but I don't hang out with them too much. Uh, I'm easy to reach. Awesome. Well, this was a lot of fun. Thanks for joining me. Well, thank you. This was great pleasure. These are good questions, too. I really like talking <laughs> about the business. That's great to hear. All right. Bye. Okay, thanks for joining us. I'm actually on the lookout for new guests for this podcast. So if you do interesting stuff in digital content, whether you're, you're a full-time YouTuber, a media executive, or run a cool niche newsletter, definitely reach out. My email address is simonowens at gmail.com. Okay, see you next week.